Now, we can take stock of these games from an economic perspective with Professor Victor Matheson from the College of the Holy Cross in Massachusetts. Thanks very much for speaking to France 24 and taking the time. So, you've written extensively about the economic viability of the Olympic Games and how we overspend each time, how this is not particularly pragmatic. How would you say is Paris measuring up? Before it started, we did hear some reports that it was going to break even. Now it's looking like another overspend, although perhaps not a massive one. Yeah, so actually, Paris looks like they're doing pretty well. Uh, this looks like it's going to be the first Summer Olympics since Sydney back in 2000, over 20 years ago, that comes in at under $10 billion. Uh, I doubt they break even, but there's a whole lot of difference between losing a few hundred million or a few billion dollars than losing tens of billions of dollars hosting the event. Now, Victor, we hear about these overspends and how they're justified by the cities, by the organizing committees, uh, by claims of sort of value added things, economic, cultural, societal, perhaps even some sort of an an un, un, intangible benefit to a city or a country. But what independent evidence would you say is there for these kinds of benefits? So typically there's not much of that. So you always hope for some sort of legacy because, uh, again, if you spend over $10 billion, there's no way you can make up that money in a short period of time. But perhaps you end up with some sort of legacy. The problem is the uh, Olympics are always in places that are wonderful lo locations like Paris. Uh, you know, if you're counting on the Olympics to put Paris on the map, uh, you, you might need to get yourself a new map. Uh, obviously, <laughs> Paris is one of the one of the most uh, uh, iconic tourist destinations in the world. And the Olympics isn't going to add to that in any significant way. Right. So one idea that we've seen raised at how to make the Olympics more cost effective is let's have it in one dedicated place each time. Would that not be very boring. I mean, especially as we're seeing Paris now raising the bar, hosting these events in these implausible but beautiful places, as you say. Yeah, so there's a couple ways we can do this. So first of all, we could have maybe not just one, but you could have a rotating group of, of cities, you know, three or four cities. Imagine an Athens and a Los Angeles and a Tokyo, uh, something like that would work. So that would keep it from getting, you know, boring because at least we change locations. Uh, another thing you can do is you can spread the games out so you don't have to have all of the events in one place because even a city like Paris may not have all the sporting facilities in place. Uh, to host the games all by itself. But if you expand it out uh, and add additional cities like they're doing for soccer and they're doing for uh, uh, surfing, uh, you know, that uh, allows you to spread out the costs and uh, makes it much more likely that you have your facilities in place already. Yeah, but having the Olympics having in the same few places each time, does that not create more of a hegemony around, around the hosts? In terms of their, you know, their benefits they are receiving from the games, the global attention on it? Yeah, well, certainly it does, right? Uh, so this is a trade-off. Uh, there is something uh, uh, interesting and nice for the fans, uh, nice for the idea of this being a world games by actually moving it around. Uh, but the question is whether that's worth uh, the tens of billions of dollar price tags that we've seen when you have it in uh, when you have the Olympics in places like like Rio that does not have the uh, the facilities in place uh, to host that, and then it ends up with a huge bill when the games are over. Right, I suppose it would be good to reuse some of those disused Athens um, stadia again. Um, if we move on now to whether these Olympics are, as the organisers have been saying, are among the most in inclusive ever and perhaps one of the greenest ever, I've just been thinking, well, does do the sponsors come into this equation? Um, surely some of the sponsors putting together all what they need to put together to uh, promote themselves during the Olympics, they are uh, emitting, they are wasting. So how is this calculation actually made and are they really going to be some of the greenest? Uh, so it turns out one of the most non-green things you can do in creating an Olympics is actually build a bunch of new facilities. Uh, concrete is one of the worst things in the world when it comes to, uh, when it comes to global climate change. And in Paris, since very, very little in the way of new facilities were constructed, uh, Paris will be come in at one of the greenest games in the last couple decades. Uh, simply build, uh, use, yeah, if you build a lot of new stuff, you're going to emit huge amounts of uh, greenhouse gases. If you can use existing facilities like Paris is doing, they're in good shape. And of course, from sponsorships, uh, sponsorships, uh, however we want to think about the global corporate world, uh, sponsorships do uh, 
uh, serve a very important role in reducing the total price tag to local taxpayers. So certainly, if someone is going to pay for an expensive games, you'd rather have it be Coca-Cola than the taxpayer in uh, the northern Paris suburbs. All right, and then perhaps about this inclusivity claim there and the, and the fact that we've got these hundreds of thousands of free tickets. Um, certainly, if you walk around Paris and talk to locals here, this, this message isn't really getting across. Most people are saying it's been prohibitively expensive for me and my family to get tickets. So how about this, this claim then? Is this something that Paris can truly say is its legacy, the fact that it's opening these games up to the world? I find that a pretty a pretty far stretch myself. Uh, remember, uh, th this is a games that people can come and watch it. Uh, if you're the sort of person who can travel across the globe uh, and and make it to Paris and enjoy accommodations for Paris, uh, sure, there's a there's a possibility for a handful of people in the local area to enjoy the spectacle of the Olympics, even without expensive tickets. But uh, let's be quite clear what the Olympics is. It's uh, it's a spectator uh, sport uh, for the wealthy worldwide who can afford to travel globally to go watch soccer and gymnastics. And perhaps we can just talk on um, the benefits for countries that are maybe big medal winners but aren't the hosts necessarily because there's got to be some incentive for countries around the world to still put so many resource into, resources into getting the most competitive teams possible if in future we're doing a kind of rotating around fewer cities system. So, so what kind of benefits do countries draw from getting those big results? Sure. Well, let's not let's not put down the idea of a feel good effect. Right. Uh, uh, Americans, we know in particular, we love the patriotic uh, uh, Olympic Games where we can rack up medals. I noticed we moved just up ahead of France in the gold medal table yesterday. Uh, these are the sort of things that uh, this is a good sort of competition between countries. And we shouldn't discount the feel-good effect uh, in, entirely. Uh, also, uh, obviously, these athletes can serve as important brand ambassadors for your country. Uh, if you see a country like Brazil, Brazil uh, has done better than most countries in the world at how much other countries like them. And why is that? Uh, because of the beautiful game they play in soccer. Uh, we see other cases where maybe uh, we have a brand new brand ambassador for St. Lucia, uh, thanks to the uh, Julian's fantastic run yesterday in the third meter. So, uh, Let's not discount uh, the, the fun impact that, the, that these games can have on spectators and countries alike. Uh, so these games may make us happy. Uh, they're just not likely to make us rich. <laughs> All right, Victor Matheson. Um... That's a, c'est un bon constat, uh, we would say in French. That's a, that's a fair point. Um, thank you very much for joining us from the College of the Holy Cross in Massachusetts. Thank you, Messi.